Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and welcome. This is Ratnadeep Chakraborty and you're listening to Book Talks from The Honest Critique. Today I'm glad and honored to have William Z. Milon with us. In 1988, he joined the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and served in the provinces of New Brunswick, Ontario and Newfoundland, Nebraska before retiring in January of 2015. He is no stranger to international policing, having served in African Haiti, and he relies upon these experiences regularly in dealing with the po political and foreign service efforts of the other contributing partner countries, whose good intentions are respected but tempered by Milan's pragmatic operational experience. Today we are going to talk about his book, Cops in Kabul, a Newfoundland peacekeeper in Afghanistan, which is based on his experience of serving in Afghanistan as an RCMP officer in 2011-12. Bill, thank you so much for taking your time and speaking to us. It's really an honor and a privilege to host you for the session. Uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and, and all your colleagues and, and friends from around the world uh, on this very topical issue, given what's going on in Afghanistan today. Um, I, I, my background is I, I spent 26 years in the Royal Canadian Mount of Police and, and uh, had a number of different roles. Uh, one of which was in 2011-2012, uh, from May 2011 to May 2012, I was the Deputy Canadian Police Contingent Commander in Afghanistan. And our role in Afghanistan at that time, as it has been for, for our, throughout the, the course of the mission, was to help build the capacity and train the Afghan National Police in, uh, in, in various policing techniques. Our focus was primarily on leadership and management training, uh, specialized policing, so forensics, major investigations, anti-corruption, and also uh, dealing with Ministry of Interior Reform. Um, because in Afghanistan, there was no separation between the policymakers in the Ministry of the Interior and law enforcement. So the minister himself was the de facto police chief for the entire country, which is problematic in a lot of ways because there's no independence of the police. We, um, we entered into Afghanistan from a training perspective as part of the NATO mission in 2003. Uh, and with that, uh, our primary focus was, we only had a small number of officers at the time, that went to Kabul and worked under the, U, the UN mission uh, to Afghanistan at the time uh, in an advisory capacity. That slowly expanded and we moved into Kandahar. And, and in Kandahar, we had the uh, Canadian Provincial Reconstruction Team. And an integral part of that was um, working directly with the Canadian military and the Afghan military to do presence patrols and to go to forward operating bases and various uh, Afghan National Police outposts to assist them as best we could. And, and we all know that that was very dangerous times. I mean, there was uh, people, people have often asked me, you know, well, uh, are there any safe places in Afghanistan? And I kind of laugh when they say that. And I say, well, not really. Um, there's some that are lower risk, but, you know, anytime you're inside the Afghan border, uh, it, it, there's always challenges from a security perspective. So um, we worked with the Canadian military. Um, and when we arrived, uh, it was the, our prime minister, Harper now, uh, which was July of 2011. So uh, slowly, all of the resources, the policing resources and military resources that were in Canada at the time and in southern Afghanistan slowly started to move northward. 
And um, our role then was to work within various um, U.S. military elements uh, to assist in training the police. And we were also working with the European uh, policing mission as well and the uh, Germans, which had the overall responsibility for policing and police training in Afghanistan. So with that, I've, I've thrown a lot of information at you right there. So I don't know if there's any questions or you, you just want me to keep going as per, um, you know, the questions that you had forwarded to me and or the topics that you wanted me to cover. Thank you so much uh, for speaking to us and giving us such a background uh, before starting. So before we d delve into the other questions, uh, because it's very important to give uh, the scenario of international policing and you've been very familiar with international policing and having worked in earlier mission in Haiti, uh, how does it help uh, right now when you went to Afghanistan? Uh, so tell us about your mission and how your mission came handy when you were in Afghanistan and probably if you could share your experience and how was it uh, there and about international policing? So um, back in 1996, when I imagine, you know, many of you listening to this, they will probably weren't even born then. Um, the, uh, I, I did a, uh, or I per, uh, participated in the United Nations mission to Haiti. Um, and when, when I look back on my experience in Haiti and I look at some of the issues that we faced in Afghanistan, there's a lot of parallels in that, you know, we were dealing with, a lot of corruption, uh, extreme poverty, um, you know, lack of infrastructure, uh, poor police training, um, the violence, organized crime. Haiti was being used as a transshipment point for drugs coming out of South America. So there was a lot of organized crime uh, um, activity at the time. Um, and then also there was, you know, illiteracy. And, uh, you know, when I got to Afghanistan, when you look at the challenges that we were facing from a training perspective or from a contextual perspective, there was a lot of similar problems. Um, one of the biggest and, 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 you know, this was kind of uh, one of the ones that really shocked me was the illiteracy rate amongst police officers, the rank and file police officers of the Afghan National Police. Uh, illiteracy was 80% plus. So you try to think, uh, first of all, how are we going to deliver training to a group that done, doesn't understand the written word? And, you know, how do you, how do you help, help those folks enforce the law if they don't understand it or can't read it? So what ended up happening is we, you know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, we started using storyboards and um, there were also various programs that were implemented by, uh, by the, uh, the U S in terms of increasing illiteracy amongst the A and P or the, the, the Afghan national police. So, so those things, uh, you know, were helpful, but there were definitely a lot of parallels, uh, particularly on the corruption front and, uh, and and poverty and, and so forth because you know the person in the street in say Port-au-Prince Haiti and the person in the street in Kabul Afghanistan are both looking just to make it through the day they're looking for how to feed their families they want to work you know they want to live in peace essentially uh, as we all do around the world so yeah, like, you know, in, in, in conflict zones or in, in areas like Haiti and Afghanistan, and there are many other others around the world, as we all know, like Syria uh, and, and so forth. It, there's a lot of very similar issues facing all of those places. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question on, in terms of how that experience in Haiti translated into or informed my actions and my and my work in uh, in Afghanistan. Yeah. So from there, let's take a leap to Afghanistan. Tell us a little bit about the time and situation when you were in, and it was a voluntary mission, right? So when you decided uh, to go for the mission, tell us about the situation and what people around you, your family, reacting for the mission to Afghanistan. Uh, tell us about the situation uh, and Afghanistan as a general perception is one of one of the most deadliest place. Uh, at least right now it is, uh, 
and with the increase in the number of attacks tell us about that point of time what do people thinking about you the, the the decision to go to afghanistan um i remember um i remember you know everybody kind of remembers you know who is old enough remembers where they were when 9/11 happened similar to you know where they were when man landed on the moon you know all of these you know key points in history people people remember where they were and in this particular case uh when i when i saw what had happened i knew right there and then that the trajectory of my career and the work that i would do would change so it wasn't long after that that um i uh i was actually transferred to our headquarters in ottawa with a group of other uh folks from across the country other police officers uh to start looking at terrorist financing and the reason that we were brought in is because we were all involved in anti money laundering so we were doing anti money laundering investigation to organize crime and so forth so those skill sets were all brought together in a critical mass to to start looking at how is terrorism being funded and is canada you know providing funding to various groups around the world so from that you know i i developed a, a very strong interest in national security and, and political science and so forth and um when the opportunity arose to uh volunteer to go to afghanistan um i put up my hand and a lot of people thought i was crazy uh when i did that they're thinking like why would you go there right do you know there's a war going on over there and i said yes i know exactly what's going on over there but you know i'm a, i'm a very firm believer in you know the un's policy of a responsibility to protect and i also believe that you know if you ignore problems like that they will eventually make it to our shores so um you know if there's things that we can do to help build the capacity and the ability of law enforcement to deal with the challenges that they're facing in Afghanistan we should go there and help them not go there and tell them what to do but go there and share ideas with them and saying look you know here's here's things that have worked for us here are things that may work for you because uh you know you can't just uh i used to call it the good idea fairy right the good idea fairy would drop into a country and say oh we're going to do this that and the other thing and have all of these different policies and programs that they're going to implement without even talking to the people on the ground so it's the difference between doing something with someone versus doing something to someone so you know being there and sharing the ideas with them and saying look we're not going to dictate to you what you do from a policing perspective all we're going to do is we're going to share with you some things that we think may work and then you have to take those and afghanize them right you have to make them your own because the cultural piece is so important i mean you know when we arrived there along with all the other countries that were made up the made up nato and upol uh we're guests in the country we're there at the behest of the afghan government to to assist we're not there to dictate now you know that in and of itself could be a whole completely other conversation you know when you're when you're looking at you know how various countries have acted within within afghanistan but you know to for me i've i've felt strongly about the issue i felt strongly about the fact that you know you have terrorist groups that are were operating out of afghanistan uh to perpetrate harm on other people around the world and uh so you know i i i decided to go and do it uh my my mom wasn't too happy about it that i was going there and and neither were my you know friends and family but they understood it so as a result i mean that's uh that's essentially how i ended up uh in afghanistan in in 2011 yeah and and, and this was 4 years before your retirement right yes it was so, yeah so i i re i retired in in january of 2015 from policing So I was there from May 2011 until May of 2012. So it it wasn't, you know, it was only a short time before I decided to retire uh 
after I arrived back in Canada. And you had this fair bit of experience of 23, 24 years of policing when you went to, when you went, went to Afghanistan. So a lot of people uh, that I had conversation with uh, said uh, the voluntary decision of serving in Afghanistan was primarily because of this young blood for experience. But you had already 23, 24 years of experience and had experience in international policing as well. So what made you take that decision? It, it, you know, for me, it was, uh, it was, uh, I, because I had had international policing experience before, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of policing. And um, it's, it's very, very different from what the type of policing that, of course, that I would do back in Canada. But I was, I was always intrigued about, you know, like, how can we help countries in need to instill the rule of law how do we help their institutions become stronger and better um you know through proper training and leadership and and guidance how can we how can we do that so that was kind of a you know the i was bitten by the international bug and uh so when i had another opportunity to do it um i i you know i said yes i'd, I'd like to go and do that and it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my career, probably the hardest thing I've ever done, but it was also one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Um, so um, for me, you know, it was uh, when when I arrived back in Canada, I had various jobs and then I was eventually transferred home back to my home province in, in Newfoundland, which is the most easterly province in Canada. Um, so I spent the last year and a half um uh, serving my in my home province and then decided that there were other things that i wanted to do and, and decided to retire that's very interesting i would want a little bit talk about canada's contribution to the war in afghanistan a lot of young audience are not aware of canada's contribution soon after the u.s invasion the contribution is large in number and over 150 people have lost their lives while serving uh, I want to especially talk about your role uh, in Afghanistan, actually, in terms of policing. Uh, what was the role of RCMP? And uh, if you could a little bit talk about Canada's role in the larger context in Afghanistan. So I'll, I'll, uh, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot in there, so I'll unpack it a little bit. By the, I'll start with the RCMP. Um, so the Royal Canadian Mounted Police is Canada's national police force, and we have various mandates uh, throughout Canada and around the world. So uh, we are the national police force, so all of the national or federal statutes, so drug enforcement, customs and excise, immigration, and so forth, those are all mandates of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We also have provincial responsibilities, provincial policing responsibilities. So. Canada is made up of 10 provinces and three territories. We have, uh, with the exception of two provinces, Ontario and Quebec, we have provincial uh, policing responsibilities. So that means that we are the police, provincial police force of all the other provinces. Okay. So that means we do day-to-day -day policing in rural communities and, and, and some cities and that uh, around Canada. And then we have a municipal mandate in some provinces as well. Uh, so our biggest detachment, uh, our CMP detachment is in our, they're in the lower mainland of British Columbia. So around the Vancouver area, we have a number of very large detachments that um, are on the perimeter of the Vancouver City Police's jurisdiction and North Vancouver has police in Delta and Abbotsford and so forth. But we have large detachments in Coquitlam and Burnaby and, and, and so forth that do municipal policing, so big city policing, right? And then we also have an international mandate because we have liaison officers in a number of strategically strategic countries around the world that uh, interact with our international law enforcement counterparts. So for example, um, in when I was in Afghanistan, we have liaison officers uh, in Islamabad. So in Islamabad, uh, if, if there are, if we need assistance from the Pakistani police or say even from, uh, you know, some of the neighboring countries, uh, 
we go through our liaison officers too, and then they will reach out to their contacts within the Pakistani police or the Indian police or wherever in the world to try and get the information that we need and vice versa. It works both ways. So, you know, the Indian police can reach out to the contact in, uh, I'm, I'm not sure where our contact would be in Mumbai or uh, in one of the other larger centers in India. And they would say, okay, we need information from Canada. We'll go through our liaison officer and they'll come back to Canada and get the information that way. So that's essentially how the RCMP is structured. With regards to the Canadian contribution, the policing contribution to Afghanistan, um, back after 9-11, um, the, of course, the call goes out for assistance uh, from, you know, U.S. allies and, and NATO allies uh, to do various things. Primarily, it was, you know, the military um, action that took place shortly after 9-11. And then uh, it, it took a couple of years before Canadian law enforcement actually went into Afghanistan. I believe 2003 is when we first started there. And I mentioned earlier about how initially there was only maybe two or three people that went there, worked within the U.N., and then gradually the mission grew. And over the course of the 11 years that we were in Afghanistan from 2003 to 2014, there was over 300 Canadian police officers that voluntarily served in Afghanistan, excuse me, in various capacities. So uh, amongst those folks, there was people who had done actually two and three tours of Afghanistan. But it wasn't just the RCMP that served in Afghanistan. We had uh, municipal police forces and provincial police forces that also served. So Toronto Police Service sent people, the Ontario Provincial Police sent people. We had people from Vancouver, Calgary, uh, Saskatoon, Halifax. So we had municipal police forces that also made a significant contribution to the policing mission as well. So I'll stop there because you probably have uh, some other questions or clarifications. So you mentioned in the book that there were over 300 police officers who actually went there in Afghanistan between that period. So in this context, I want to understand a little bit what was the Afghan security structure like and how police forces were actually helping there and mention this interesting thing that the military is credited uh, that they have served in that region with police forces also play a very integral and probably it appears in the footnote of the history but it's very important so if you can explain the roles and responsibility that was vested upon the RCMP that time and what was security structure so so with regards to the military I mean I, I can share some of that with you I'm, I'm certainly not a military expert you know I, I was there from a policing context but um we would not have been able to do our job from a training perspective in the various bases and, and units around the country had it not been for the security envelope provided by the military. Because, you know, we're not soldiers and they're not police officers. And we both, you know, kind of both groups know, like we each have our lane. And, you know, if everybody stays in their lane and does their job, things will work more smoothly. Um, so we were, our, our police officers were embedded. I mentioned earlier about the provincial reconstruction team in Kandahar. We had Canadian police officers that were embedded there with the military and they would go out doing, uh, this is pre, uh, 20, uh, July, 2011, uh, when the end of the combat mission was, was announced, but they would go out and do presence patrols and go out and do training in various bases. Um, we also had people embedded within the European policing uh, mission, UPOL. Um, and that was more aligned with uh, our expertise, given that it was strictly a policing mission. So, you know, we worked a lot with uh, the Germans and the, Sw and, and the Swedes and the Finns and, and, and the UK. We had, you know, a, n a number of countries that we worked with and we had people with various sets of expertise that were uh, used in various training uh, programs throughout uh, throughout the country. And we actually, when I was there, we had uh, two gentlemen that actually spoke uh, Dari and Farsi. So they were indispensable. I mean, 
it was fantastic. And when you're when you're training the Afghan police and you have somebody who's speaking to them in their in their own language, made a huge difference. Um, so uh, I'm, uh, the the mission itself, like we we weren't um, we didn't do any tactical training uh, with the police. And that was that was a Canadian policy decision. Like we weren't going to we weren't going to be teaching them how to shoot guns or anything like that because there was a lot of other folks that were very capable, uh, primarily the military, uh, that were you know helping them with that. And 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 the one thing I think people tend to forget is that being a police officer in Afghanistan and it is very different from being a police officer in other countries, whereby there's there's an element of military training that you need as a police officer in Afghanistan uh, in order to keep you safe. Whereas in, in because because of the adversary that you're facing, right? A lot of heavy, heavy armaments and and uh, um, it, it, the police aren't equipped. They don't carry RPGs. They don't drive tanks. They don't like so you 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 need. You, you need cooperation with your military counterparts to be able to do that. And sadly, uh, with the counterinsurgency that was constantly occurring in Afghanistan, the police were on the front lines. They were at the cold face of, of the counterinsurgency effort, and they were not equipped to do it. And um, the, the, the military should have had more of a presence in being able to assist them in that regard. And as a result, there was a lot of AMP officers who lost their lives because they simply were not equipped to deal with, you know, groups like the Haqqani Network, groups like the Taliban, you know, and, and, and other insurgency groups because they were more heavily armed. So that's, I hope that kind of gives you a, a, a good overview of, of, of how things kind of worked. So you were stationed in Kabul uh, at that time and you mentioned that it was not safe as you don't know which car might have an IED or which uh, car might have uh, a bomb that was about to blast. So it's dangerous, right? Tell us about your experience of staying in Kabul and living through life and death every day. It, um, you know, living inside of a compound for, for 12 months uh, was, was interesting in and of itself. And one of my colleagues said, he said, well, it's kind of like being in prison, but the guns are facing outward, right? Um, so, uh, you know, security was always first and foremost on our minds when, when, we, were, when we were in Kabul. Uh, re regardless of where you are in the country, you always have to be mindful of your surroundings and always be aware. Um, and that in and of itself, always being switched on and... There was never downtime. So when you were traveling, you were always head on a swivel looking around. You know, uh, if you saw situations that looked, um, you know, somewhat problematic, you always took um, action to kind of avoid those things. Um, so, you know, it, 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 you're right. And there was no safe place, right? Because uh, when there were complex attacks, I mean, missiles were being launched. Uh, you had RPGs that were flying overhead. And in the neighborhood that we were, uh, where, the, where the embassy was, um, our neighbors were the United Kingdom and the United States. So those acted as lightning rods for uh, for for Taliban or Haqqani network attacks. They would always go if they could hit the UK embassy or if they could hit the US embassy. We were kind of caught, in, and even I mean, we had we had an RPG hit the Canadian embassy when I was there, and you know, so the, we, that was just the nature of of the situation that we were in. Is that it was a magnet for um, for uh, terrorist attacks, or it was targeted for terrorist attacks. Uh, I remember back in, I think it was May, I had written a date down here. Uh, it was September of 2011. And uh, two streets behind the Canadian embassy is where uh, 
It was a Bernahud and Rabani. He was a high peace council representative for the Afghan government at the time. And there had been a meeting arranged with two Taliban emissaries at his residence. And again, his residence was only located a couple of streets behind where the Canadian embassy was. And we were out sitting, uh, sitting outside one evening and it was just after supper and we were having tea. And all of a sudden there was this massive explosion and come to find out that one of the Taliban emissaries was a suicide bomber. And once he got inside Rabani's house, he detonated the bomb and killed a whole bunch of people. So, you know, like those are the kinds of things that, that we were facing on a constant, constant basis. And, you know, uh, another technique which had been developed was magnetic mines or magnetic explosives. They could come by on a scooter and if they knew you were, you know, uh, uh, working with NATO or, you know, law enforcement, they'd simply clip it to your vehicle and drive away and then you're stuck in traffic. There's nothing you can do, right? So it, it, it was, you, you, we were always vigilant. Um, but, uh, you know, some people have asked me, you know, were you afraid? And I, and I, I don't know that you can operate in an environment like that if you're afraid. Was I concerned for my safety? All the time, right? As was everyone. So we always had to take measures to make sure if, if, if um, uh, the security levels were too high, we didn't go outside. We would just simply lock down, ride it out, and, and then wait for other opportunities, you know, reschedule meetings or, you know, the work that we had to do. We would just, you know, move it, move it down the road uh, until the threat had passed. So, so at this point of time, I have two questions. When you're mentioning, uh, this came to my mind. Uh, if you'd want to talk a little uh, bit about when you were about to operate in your homeland, you know about, you know about the enemy, what it looks like, uh, where it might come from. But when you operate in a foreign line, like for example Kabul, you do you do not know who the enemy is, whom you have to protect. How do you do? Because the enemy can be in any shape, right? So was it like you have to be extra careful in every step? What is going on in your mind, actually? You're, um, you, you, you always have a heightened sense of awareness, uh, given for the reasons that you just mentioned that, um, you know, traditionally in, in conflict, in, in wars, you have you know, different groups wearing different uniforms. So you could tell, you know, one country from another or one adversary from another. In the context of Afghanistan, it was, you know, uh, you, you had people that uh, dressed the same as the local Afghan people, um, you know, and it was very, very, very different uh, and very difficult to be, a, excuse me, to be able to identify them, and it was it was it was fighting an enemy in plain uh, that was hiding in plain sight, and I kind of uh, I, I I it's kind of like COVID, right? So COVID is an enemy you can't see, but you know it's out there. So when you go outside, you have to take precautions to protect yourself against COVID. You know it's there, and. You know you had to do certain things, wear a mask, keep your distance, all those sorts of things to keep yourself safe. So it's it's very similar in what we uh, in what we did when we were going outside the wire um, and and doing things. Uh, we had to take certain precautions, and um, uh, like one of the things, for example, is that you would if you're in traffic, nobody ever opened the doors of the vehicle, ever, right? Like you just did not, because you did not know uh, until you arrived at your destination, right? If you got stuck in traffic and you had people around your vehicle, that you would never open the vehicle doors. So those are, you know, that's just a, a small example of how you would prepare um, or, or, you know, protect yourself against an adversary that wasn't always in plain sight. Interestingly, you have also mentioned in the book uh, about the virtue of patience and being aware of cultural sensitivities in policing, which is very relevant to the present context. What we have seen in America in the 
recent few months with the brutality exercised by police forces. Tell us about these key virtues uh, you mentioned in the book. You know, I, I, I'll uh, I'll go back to uh, Sir Robert Peel, right, who's considered the father of modern day policing. And he says, you know, the public are the police and the police are the public. So the police, the police are charged with the responsibility of protecting the public. And in order to do that, there has to be an agreement of some sort of social contract with the population that, you know, we are... There are laws that people have to follow and the police have the responsibility of, of enforcing those laws. Now, um, you know, it's very topical, the issue that you're talking about, about, you know, patience and, and heavy handedness and cultural respect or, or sensitivities, uh, because we're seeing a lot of that happen around the world today. And um, it, 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 you know, dialogue is always the way. And, you know, the vast majority of police officers that I know or ever worked with would much prefer to be able to talk to somebody and deal with them in that way and get compliance that way than have to use heavy, more heavy handed techniques. So the test in, 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 in Canada and in North America in general is that you have to use force that is proportional to the threat. So if I meet you on the street as a police officer and you're really angry at me or angry at some issue and you're yelling and screaming and, you know, calling me names and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Right. You police officers have to have um, the personal restraint or the ability to tolerate that sort of thing. And let's not forget too, that police officers are human. So, when they go to work some days, they might have had a, you know, a, a fight with their spouse. The kids were misbehaving. You know, there's all sorts of problems at home. And then they bring that to work. Now, that doesn't excuse uh, behavior if it's wrong. It might explain it, that they were under stress. And, and, and the fact that this situation that they're facing at work was stressful and, and led to a poor outcome. Um, those things happen. But it is imperative for law enforcement to be very tolerant to a limit, as long as people aren't getting hurt and, and that sort of thing, uh, and respect cultural norms. So, um, you know, which is not always easy to do because, you know, um, you have cities that are very, very diverse um, you know, in some cultures, like in Afghanistan, you don't have male police officers dealing with females, you know, those sorts of things. Um, so you have to be mindful of that. And you, you have to appreciate that when you're doing your training, you have to um, uh, uh, allow them the space to adapt things to make it their own. So, you know, it, it Again, it's very topical as to what's going on in the world. You see a lot of it in the United States. You see it in Canada, um, you know, in other places, I'm sure, in India as well. Um, you know, I know there's been a series of protests over the last, you know, number of weeks and by farmers and, you know, all of that sort of thing. There were, were people, they, if you're living in a democracy, that's what a right you have. You have a right to you know, demonstrate if as long as you do it peaceably and as long as you don't hurt other people. Um, when that starts happening, that's when police have to intervene. So I, I hope that answers answers your question. Yeah, it did actually. Uh, I, I, I just want to expand a little bit on that. I would ask you on the situation that was happening in Afghanistan. Uh, if you can also talk about certain boundaries that you need to maintain while you were walking, especially in the region, like a police officer going to a house uh, to question or interrogate a woman. So tell us about the cultural sensitivity you had to maintain in Afghanistan. Probably share some ground experiences. Well, anecdotally, I, I mean, you know, in in my role there, I was I was responsible for for the activities of the Canadian police officers that were dispersed throughout the country. But one thing I can tell you is that in uh, Bamian province, one of one of the the I guess. Uh, wonderful things that we did there was 
we had three Canadian police officers that were in Bamian and they worked with the local law enforcement there. And the governor in, uh, uh, in Bamian province was a female, which was an, an anomaly in Afghanistan, right? You didn't have females uh, in positions of power like that in you know, any other part of the country. And this lady, um, I, I can't recall her name right now, but I had met her once. And this lady was a ball of energy. She was absolutely amazing. And she was advocating for women's rights, for, you know, for young, young women to be educated, to have a more prominent role in Afghan society. And uh, in Bamian province, uh, we had established, along with the Afghan National Police, uh, a female working group. So female Afghan police officers that had formed a group that were all together. There was probably a dozen or more of them that uh, were working uh, on police related issues, but from a female perspective. So, you know, we gained a lot of insight from that, as did their male counterparts. I mean, it, it's very, very difficult when you have hundreds of years of history um, to, from a cultural standpoint, to be able to change things easily. And, you know, it, there's no question that if you're uh, a female in a place like Afghanistan, especially now with the Taliban gaining more and more ground, uh, it's very, very difficult for, for, for females, um, which is, it, it's so sad. I mean, that, that this is, this is occurring, but it's one of the things that you have to keep in mind as you're trying to uh, assist in developing programs or, uh, um, you know, law enforcement training. Like we're very mindful of, of that. Like we can't, you can't just say, well, you know, you're a police officer, you're going to go in. And if there's female there, it doesn't matter. You, you can't do that. You, you just can't do that. And you have to be like, that can cause more problems than it, than it, uh, than it alleviates. Yeah. So I hope that answers it does actually. In this point of time, I want to come to an interesting perspective of yours probably that will shape the later part of the conversation with what is happening right now. So if you can give us a brief about the Afghan security structure, what it looks like, not only the police structure, but also the military structure, the capabilities uh, when you're working at that time and how they were assisting the NATO forces in missions. Tell us a little bit about that. So with regards to uh, when I was there or when our group was there in 2011, 2012, um, I mentioned earlier uh, about the police being on the front line of the counterinsurgency um, issue. Um, <clears throat> that should have been a military responsibility. And I remember uh, we were speaking to the commander of the Afghan uniform police He's named Lieutenant General Atmar. And we were having a conversation about corruption and, uh, you know, what we could do to help deal with corrupt police officers and this, that, and the other thing. And his conversation with us, there was probably a dozen of us uh, at the time that sat and listened to this man. Very well-educated, um, very well-spoken, was on top of all the issues, responsible for 60,000 police officers throughout Afghanistan, the largest portion of the Afghan National Police. And he, you know, he, he said to us after we, we were talking about anti-corruption, he said, look, I agree with everything you're saying. I Listen, I don't like corrupt police officers any more than you do. But he said, you know, you know what my number one priority is? He says, is keeping my police officers alive. That's my number one priority. Because if they're not alive, all the rest of it is academic. And it kind of, you know, it struck us in saying like, yeah, he's absolutely right. You know, telling us about getting calls at two o'clock in the morning, people screaming, his own people screaming on the phone, they needed help. And, you know, no help came. Because the relationship between the military and the police at the time was very fractured. Uh, and it's a matter of personalities, right? If you have the right people in the right chairs, uh, and again, this is this is my perception and, and my view of, of the situation at the time. Um, if they don't get along, they're not going to help each other. Right. And uh, there were times when the military should have intervened when they didn't. 
and it resulted in you know loss of life uh, on the policing side and there's numerous examples of of that sort of activity that happened so it wasn't as integrated as it should be um and and as a result i mean you know the, the people lost their lives over it um so you know that's that's kind of the, the way things were structurally uh when when i was there and the current situation there, I'm I'm not really sure. Um, uh, it, I found it very discouraging when I, you know, I I, I followed since I, I came back from Afghanistan. I, you know, I periodically follow what's going on in the country, um, and you know, I saw recent videos where you see convoys of Afghan National Army in their Humvees driving up the Taliban checkpoints and throwing down their weapons and giving and giving all their equipment and all that sort of thing, which I find very discouraging. So, uh, you know, which leads us to the current situation in Afghanistan right now, where, you know, the, the, the UN has said there's over three and a half million Afghan refugees now that are, uh, that have been, um, uh, uh, displaced. There's, you know, food issues. There's security issues now because the Taliban are emboldened by what's going on and they're taking more and more territory. They're not interested in a political solution. Uh, they just want to take the country back and enforce their own brand of, of, of governance, which is very barbaric in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, all the gains that have been made over, over the last number of years are all being lost in a matter of weeks now, which is unfortunate. And as soon as, you know, the last U.S. troops pull out at the end of August, it's going to go, it, it, it's going to be a free for all again. And, and you're going to have some people, you know, a lot of people caught in a very difficult situation. And we talked about the interpreters and their families, what they're facing right now. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's very difficult for Afghanistan right now, for sure. I will come back a little later on the Afghanistan situation at the moment. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about your travel to Kandahar and uh, some of the stories uh, from ground probably you mentioned some of the security challenges that you face uh, which might be relevant even today because it's still dangerous and challenges which uh, might be same a little difficult right now probably if you could share some personal experiences from ground so again when you know i talked about some of the issues security issues that we faced when we were going outside the wire and and and, and you know, that was always the case in the time that I was there, regardless of where we were going. If we were going to uh, meet at the UN or the Ministry of the Interior or UPOL headquarters or ISAF headquarters or various bases located in the, in the greater Kabul area, uh, you were always um, ready for some sort of conflict if, that, if it came to that. I mean, the, the general rule for us as police officers were Number one, we're not soldiers. Uh, yes, we are capable of protecting ourselves and protecting others, but you know, you 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 don't bring a a, a rifle to an RPG fight, right? So you know, for us, it was all about if you're in a situation that's getting bad, you get out of there. Like you you just go, you know, seek safety wherever you can. Um, the <clears throat> In, in, in some of my travels there, I had a chance to, I spent the vast majority of my time in and around the Kabul area because that's what my, my responsibility primarily was. Um, we had other people that were dispersed throughout, throughout Afghanistan, but I did have a chance to go to Mazari uh, e Sharif in the north. And, um, you know, it, it, it's um, whenever you land anywhere, um, there's always, a, a significant security protocol that's put in place to make sure you get from A to B safely. And, and that's the way it always was. Um, you know, uh, there, there is one, uh, there is one thing that I mentioned in the book with regards to, um, and, and I don't think I mentioned this, but with regards to one of the, uh, drivers at the embassy, I, I befriended when I was there, real nice guy. Um, had a, you know, had, had uh, three kids, um, you know, was working and all that. And I asked him, you know, just out of curiosity after two or three months of being there, 
you know, what do you, what do you think of, of all this? What do you think of us being here? And, and his answer was very, very poignant in that he said, I understand that you're here to help us. And you come here at great risk and you're far away from your, your home and loved ones. But he said, all we want is, you know, I want my boys to go to school. I want to work. I want to live in peace. And I thought to myself, you know what? You're no different than any dad anywhere else in the world, right? And so we're a lot more. The one, the one big thing that I, you know, I took away from this is that regardless of where you are in the world, we're a lot more alike than we are different. Yes, we speak different languages. We have different cultures, different customs and all that. But kids are kids. Like it doesn't matter if you're a kid in Canada or you're a kid in Afghanistan. Like kids want to play. They want to laugh. They want to have fun. You want to do all that's you know kids uh, you know so so those are the types of things that really kind of stick with me uh but in terms of you know wherever we we traveled um there was always you were always mindful of your surroundings and how things could go from as we used to say zero to ludicrous in no time flat right you know without any warning whatsoever i mean that's the highlight for the podcast but how was the situation in Gandahar? How was the situation over there when you were there? And tell us about the process about actually helping the police officers because one, it is a dangerous province to work in and training people to operate in the region is another setback because uh, there's a huge challenge uh, because of the Taliban forces on ground. So uh, tell us about these uh, challenges. I mentioned earlier about when when our contingent arrived in Afghanistan in May of 2011, uh, the Canadian government was was getting ready to make the decision to uh, withdraw all Canadian troops and police officers from the southern part of Afghanistan uh, because they were going to end the combat role. And so um, I didn't have the opportunity because of what was going on to actually get to Kandahar. I've had lots of friends that have served and served at the provincial reconstruction team in Kandahar. And, and, and based on what they told me, it was, uh, it was the wild west. Um, you know, in retrospect, when we look at the role of, of police officers in Kandahar work and that were embedded with the military, um, you know, in my opinion, we were not equipped to to deal with that type of environment just because like that's the military's role and the military. I mean, they're experts in that stuff. And it was only because of, again, the security envelope that they provided us. And even then, I mean, there was no guarantees. There was all there was all sorts of close calls and sad events that occurred you know, when, when, when some of our folks were down or over the years of the mission. Um, but, um, you know, there was great strides had been made um, because of the work done by our Canadian police officers down at the provincial reconstruction team. As soon as the announcement was made to start pulling Canadian troops and Canadian police officers out of Kandahar, um, you know, all of that, the work that we have been done was handed off to the United States. Policing was not a, was not a priority of the U.S. Uh, in that part of the world. It was counterinsurgency. It was dealing with a number of other issues. Uh, and I, I understand that. So all the work that had been done sort of kind of faded away and it kind of reverted back to kind of the way it was. Um, so all the police officers that had been trained there uh, weren't getting the same level of support that they were prior to that, um, which is sad. Um, so now, um, you know, that part of Afghanistan being the home to, of the Taliban, um, there's, there was a, you know, the, the level of risk significantly increased, you know, in, in terms of rule of law. And um, right now, um, I would suspect that, the, you know, the law enforcement presence in that part of the the country is is uh is significantly absent for a lot of reasons uh fair being one of the biggest ones and not having the logistical or or political support to be able to deal with the taliban with it i also 
I'd like to know about the moral of the police forces on ground who you might have interacted with yeah so tell us about the moral because uh, they know that what they know what they're signing for right because i was telling that uh, as a person you're coming from a foreign country and you know you will stay for a stint of a year or a two but i don't know about the moral of the afghan forces who they that they have to this it's that their country and they have to uh, stay there as long as uh, they're serving it's that's a, uh, i guess a little more difficult question to answer right deep because uh, you know i i suspect that uh, there was a lot of the amp officers that were very uh probably initially they were you know the morale was a lot higher because you know they were getting training they were you know getting paid and all of these sorts of things as the years went on things started to fade support support started to fade um because one of the biggest fears a lot of them had was you know you you guys can't leave here you know we need you to stay because excuse me because people knew that as, as soon as the military troops and the the law enforcement support started to withdraw from the country that things were going to go bad and we're witnessing that right now so you know their biggest fear is coming true uh in that the taliban are are taking back the country uh which is um uh, which is tragic i mean you know it's uh um i i i can't imagine what the folks in afghanistan are feeling right now uh in terms of you know this changing of the guard again um that's happening in afghanistan because it's going to be a very very different place um uh once the taliban are back in power So I want your perspective that the war on terror that you have started became a conflict between the US and the Afghans even civilians at one point of time especially uh, we have see, uh, seen what have happened to a lot of innocent civilians uh, being affected with for example drone strikes uh, even though it was not there uh, at the point of time when you were serving but a larger faction of people were a little if uh, if not dissatisfied but a little uh, con- uh, affected at least if i could use the word uh or skeptical of the presence of foreign troops who do not belong to afghanistan right so how was your interaction with the civilians did you see they were taking everything with a pinch of salt when you were approaching them or talking to them so what was their reaction personally didn't experience uh, you know much pushback from any afghan civilians or afghan police officers that i interacted with um i again i th- i think it's all in your approach in in uh in how you deal with people i mean if you approach people with respect and um and 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 with an uh an approach of you know honestly wanting to assist and help in any way you can i think outcomes are much more different than if you're going in there and trying to tell people what to do right because it goes back to what i was saying earlier about you know um if you have a training program that you want to i- implement you need input from people that it impacts because they're the ones that are going to be carrying out the 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 responsibility so uh when you it's better to have something somebody do something with you as opposed to do something to you and i think that you know the the former uh when you work with people um uh, tend to have better outcomes so uh, you know based on that approach uh for me personally um Uh, I'm sure that there are other members of the contingent that I was with or some of my other colleagues throughout the years that had different experiences when it came to that but again it, I think it's all in your approach and it all depends on the circumstances that people find themselves in because you know any any afghan who was seen as colluding or working with foreign troops or foreign entities um you know It, you were labeled a traitor or whatever when in actual fact all they're trying to do is make their country better 
they want to help their country they want to because it is their country it's not my country you know and um you know it'll be no different than and 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 when you when you look at the other side of the coin you say well how would we feel in canada if we had foreign troops here and they were here telling us what to do and where to go and how to move and all that kind of stuff right so you you know there's a certain level of of empathy that's required now you know people some people listening to this may think you know you're you're a little bit pollyannish about this and you think that you know you know everybody join hands sing kumbaya and 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 the world would be a better place no i you know what i'm saying is that if you use mutual respect and um uh you approach things in the proper way you tend to have better outcomes that's no it's not a guarantee but you you will have a better outcome the problem now lies in the fact that um the logistical and military and security support required to uh maintain the gains that were made over x number of years in Afghanistan are no longer going to be there and you have a group of people the Taliban that are looking to exploit that now and um you know and and take back the government that were control of the country Now let me come to the most interesting part of the book while I was reading because a lot of people have written about the experience in Afghanistan but I'm sure that no one has written about this fact that you brought out that we all visit the place we all see what is happening but we don't talk about it we always had the thing it's a third world country which has its problem but you mentioned the book about corruption and bureaucratic process and some major hindrances during the mission uh could you talk about uh, these problem and if there are any other problems for example you mentioned the book about pollution sewage problem so how does that come under civil hindrance and not just the security hindrance in your book as you mentioned so it, you know very important point you know climate change is is on is very topical in everybody's mind these days i mean you know you see you you got we've got wildfires in western canada right the hottest temperatures ever recorded you've got flooding in india i saw on the news central china has had had 617 mm of rain in in 3 days um you know like so it's 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 all around us right in terms of the environment and and you know one of one of our biggest fears i guess was exactly that the environment um the uh the military medical personnel used to do air quality tests um in uh, i think i'm not sure it was every month or every two months or whatever and uh, i remember reading a report i think i still have a copy of it here somewhere that said that the the particulate in the air uh of fecal matter was like 20% right and i'm thinking what like are you kidding me but you know, when i think back to you know the 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 sewage um like you know the open trenches and 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 that sort of thing there was no indoor um there's no central plumbing system or sewage system that drains it from buildings and 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 it goes out for, to a treatment facility and then into a a pond like you see in other places in the world um you know the trucks would come in pump out the sewage tanks and then they would go on the outskirts of the city and just spray it over a flat piece of land and then the sun and all that would dry it and then when the wind kind of whipped up you know it would be dusty and all that so you had that sort of thing mixed in the air along with people burning plastics and rubbers and uh you know all coal um exhaust fumes all of that toxic mix that would blanket the city uh you know quite often and almost on a daily basis so you know being there and we didn't wear masks we probably should have but uh you know a, a lot of people including myself you know ended up with re- respiratory issues or got sick and that sort of thing so that was you know you you were worried about you know being shot or blown up but there was also this other part over here that you were being subjected to every single day you'd have a sore throat or or sore eyes and that because of the smoke and all that sort of thing so yeah it, it, the environmental piece was 
which was, you know, extremely important, but, you know, it was, it was downplayed or not thought of as much because of the uh, security situation throughout the country. Yeah, so tell us about the corruption and bureaucratic process, which acts as an obstacle for the development in Afghanistan. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So uh, a couple of the officers that were in my contingent, um, so we were always looking for ways to streamline processes and, and, and help with regards to, you know, simple security measures or things that could be done that wouldn't require um you know any sort of physical force or anything like that like the, that could be done within within the rubric of of uh government departments like simple administrative processes that could change to be able to do things so the department of motor vehicles okay that provide licensing uh you know for drivers and license plates and all that sort of thing okay so there was uh, two two of our folks uh, had the idea that they could go in there and be able to help reorganize with the help of civilian assistance, people who had expertise and administrative processes and that sort of thing, and kind of reorganize uh, the um, Department of uh, Motor Vehicles in in Kabul. So when word got out. Uh, that uh, they were looking at this type of approach. Both of our officers were were threatened because uh, the number of the, the vast majority of people that were working in the motor vehicle branch were all police officers, and they were taking money from people uh, as as you know corrupt payments to kind of move their files to the top of the pile so they'd get their license quicker, or they'd get their documents quicker and that sort of thing. So it was a cash cow for a lot of police officers that were working within the Department of Motor Vehicles. So at a low level, right, you're talking corruption right on the front lines of people trying to go in and get their license renewed or whatever it was they were looking for at this particular government office but it was being hindered by the fact that you had a whole bunch of people that were corrupt and were taking this money. And instead of the money going into the government coffers, it was going into the pockets of the people that were working there. So that's just one small example of, uh, of corruption. Uh, on a larger scale, when I was there, the Kabul Bank, the Kabul Bank is the largest bank in Afghanistan. I don't know if that's still the case, but uh, it was the bank that received all the donor funds from uh, various countries around the world to support, you know, uh, various programs to support their civil service or, you know, pay their police officers or firefighters, their military personnel, teachers, all that kind of stuff. Um, there was uh, a, a group of directors uh, that were, that had decided that, uh, and Hamid Karzai's brother was one of them, uh, decided that they were gonna use this bank as their own piggy bank. And they started taking money from the bank and uh, using it to buy high-end real estate in, in Dubai. Uh, they bought Pamir Airways, one of them did uh, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and they bought interest in oil and gas companies. And as a matter of fact, $20 million went to Hamid Karzai's 2009 presidential campaign. Um, so, you know, all of that money that was destined to for various programming uh, was all being diverted for personal gain. I remember because we did, being there as police officers, we did not have any executive authority in terms of being able to arrest anybody, right? So we, we did not have that capability. I remember being at the Kabul International Airport one time on the private side of the airport. And my, my uh, commander and I were standing there. We were waiting to pick up one of our colleagues that was coming back from leave. And I remember seeing three brand new Toyota Land Cruisers pull up and gentlemen getting out of all three of them. And they were well-dressed and they had big Samsonite suitcases that were shrink wrapped in plastic. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that those suitcases were full of money and they were going to Dubai. 
right? So those are the kinds of things when we talk about corruption. Um, you know, we we had people embedded in various investigative units that were helping investigate corruption. Uh, you know, corruption within the judiciary, corruption of politicians, um, all sorts of things. And when some of these investigations got to the prosecutor's desk, they disappeared. Right? Nobody got charged. So you know, there, there's just so many other examples, Ratnadi, that I could talk about. It, it, it's just astounding, uh, you know, and and it, and it makes it, it makes a huge difference in as to whether uh, you know uh, programs can advance or not. Uh, I mean, when you have people at the top that are, you know, filling their pockets, um, no different than what we what we saw in South Africa with Jacob Zuma, right? So. You know that so it, it's it's not just Afghanistan. There's many other countries around the world that are experiencing the same thing at the expense of the people that they're supposed to be looking after. So, uh, how relevant uh, is the issue of Taliban getting most of its fund from the narcotic trade uh, prevalent today? Yeah, I mean the numbers vary in terms of how much how much money uh, the Taliban are making from various criminal activities. I mean, opium is is you know that one that's been ongoing for many many years. Uh, uh, you know, farmers being uh, being co opted and you know, being threatened that if you don't you know grow opium or if you don't give us a share of what you make from this stuff, uh, you know, bad things will happen to you. Um, you know, I, I would, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that they're involved in other criminal activity. And there's no doubt in my mind that they have people who are sympathetic to the cause that are donating to them um, from various countries for various reasons. So, um, you know, the, the, the Taliban seem to be fairly well funded. Um, you know, uh, it, it doesn't, you know, terrorism and organized crime. So. If if you're a, um, if you're an organized crime group, it doesn't make you a terrorist. But if you're a, ter a terrorist, that makes you an organized crime group, right? So there, you know, if terrorist groups are criminal groups, right? They're involved in criminal activity, um, you know, but their ideology and that is different. The amount of funding required for uh, for activities of the Taliban are a lot less than than you know. Uh, than organized crime groups because organized crime groups do it purely out of greed. So drug traffickers are trying to make more money and, and this sort of thing. I'm sure the Taliban, if they can make a billion dollars, they they do it. Um, but you know their financial needs are a lot less than you know other than I guess what they're doing right now, which is military action to take back the country. Yeah, that would require some money. But. Um, you know they're they're running money through you know there's a lot of there's a lot of underground banking hawala that's going on because hawala the hawala system is based on trust and it's very difficult to track because there's not as much there's not as many financial records available uh, so it makes it different difficult for law enforcement to kind of track that stuff um, so you know I'd say cash is is you know. Uh, the, the primary, the prime, they primarily use cash uh, as opposed to any other form of, of currency. I mean, we've hear, heard, you know, people talking about cryptocurrencies and all that sort of thing. Uh, you know, with cryptocurrencies, you got to have, you got to have access to technology. You got to know what you're doing, and it's it's kind of volatile, right? So. You know, one day, you know, Bitcoin might be worth this. And then the next day, it's probably half that. Um, so and it's more it's more difficult to manage. But I'd say that their their sources of revenue are, you know, they're not limited as to where they get their money from. They'll take it from anywhere. But I'd say drug trafficking is is, is still remains the biggest one for sure. If you could also explain for viewers about the complex web of how Al Qaeda, which hides behind Taliban to carry out attacks, and Pakistan, which funds a huge section of the Haqqani network, uh, about Haqqani network is an issue in Afghanistan at the moment. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I think that uh, it really worries me what's what's happening for a lot of reasons, what's happening in Afghanistan right now, because uh, I fear that it's going to become the epicenter of, you know, for for terrorism in terms of training uh, various terrorist groups, because you have the Taliban, you have remnants of Al Qaeda, you have ISIS, um, you know, you have you have all these groups that are kind of, um, you know, they're they're they coalesce around the issue of you know they hate the West and they want to do damage to the West and particularly so. So that's a fear, right? I mean, if one thing that I've, in my experience and, and everything that I've read over the years about groups like Al Qaeda and the Taliban is that they have a lot of patience, a lot of patience. And, you know, there, there was a, a quote I read a long time ago that, you know, uh, it talks about uh, uh, an Afghan who says to, you know, somebody from the West that say, you may have the watches, but we have the time. Right. And, uh, it's true. Right. I mean, patients, they will wait and they will wait. And just like they've done now, like they've waited 14 years, 15 years, 20 years to take back the country. So, you know, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's 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 troubling it really is troubling and it saddens you know like i mentioned earlier you know people that i worked with over there i worry about you know what it's going to be like for them and uh and even the neighboring countries right i mean pakistan iran and and you know all the stands up north and you know it, it, it's if, if you start having a lot of turmoil there it's going to bleed out into uh other countries as well in that neighborhood. Do you think uh, right now uh, the Afghan forces are capable enough to fight the Taliban? And do you think this chaos might lead to a civil war? I, you know, I, I generally consider myself a pretty optimistic person, but from based on what I've, you know, what I've seen and read uh, going on in Afghanistan currently, um, I, I think they're going to have a hard time uh, I think the Taliban, if it continues on the same path, I think they, the, the Taliban are going to take back the country. I also think that the the military, because, you know, their, their supporters, the U.S. military and all that are pulling out of the country. I think they're kind of hedging their bets and they're saying, look, um, you know, let's let's the Taliban are telling us that if we give up our arms and our you know, uh, our equipment and all that laid on our weapons and, and uh, they, they will leave us alone. I'm very, very doubtful uh, of that. Um, but, you know, like that's, that's significant gains for the Taliban because not only are they, there is their adversary, primary adversary giving up, they're also getting all their equipment. So, um, which which emboldens them to keep going and keep doing what they're doing. But I but I anticipate that um, Afghanistan is gonna is gonna devolve into um, you know as you just said probably another civil war and you know this group fighting that group and it, it's just it's such a difficult situation and and. You know, I'm not sure a political solution. And again, this is my opinion. I, it, it, a political so, a solution is very far off, in my view, um, because you don't have you need the right people in the, in the right chairs that are willing to that have the authority to be able to make decisions with regards to any sort of peace agreement. And as it stands right now, it, it just seems like a free for all. Why do you think Canada's role in this, as discussed earlier, that more than 150 officials have lost their lives? Do you think there's a moral obligation of Canada in Afghanistan? Well, you know, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the, you know, the responsibility to protect and whatever that looks like. And, and uh, I think given um, the fact that all, uh, you know, military troops have been pulled out of the country, um, I, I think... You know the there's there's not an there's not an appetite 
that I can see to put Canadian troops back in Afghanistan. I don't see, I don't foresee that happening. I think the only way that uh, Canada is going to be able to help Afghanistan is through, you know, through development. Um, but in order to have development, you need a security envelope to be able to, you know, if you're going to go in and build schools and, and dams and, and infrastructure and all that sort of thing, um, you need, you need, the protection to be able to do that. And until that happens, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, the Afghanistan is in for a bit of a rough ride over the next number of years. But I, I you know, I, it saddens me that, you know, the gains that were made and the sacrifices that were made by Canada and other countries, uh, you know, after 20 years, it seems to be all for naught. But you know, if somebody were to ask me, do I think it was worth going there? I, I would answer categorically yes, because in the time that we were there, and I'm and when I say we, I'm talking about the international community, and I'm talking about you know the the 300 and so police officers from Canada that worked there. You know, we we did some good, we did some very good things. Um, the, you know, the sustainability of those programs is a different conversation, right? Because as we can see now with the, how things are, are, are going badly there. But, you know, for periods of time, good things were being done and that's all you can do. In the time that you're there, try to make the, try to make, leave the place better than you found it, right? And if that means that you move the goalposts, you know, a meter uh, in, the, in the time that you were there, great. Um, you know, that's a meter further ahead than, you know, they were, you know, the year before. So, you know, uh, I, I, I hope that, uh, you know, there's that uh, the Afghans can find peace in, in some way, shape or form, because if not, it's going to be, uh, again, it's going to be a, uh, a terrible place to be, uh, especially if the Taliban takes over. So I want people to leave the podcast in a happy mood and hence I kept these questions for the end. I heard you talk about your parents' reaction when you joined the RCMP and you got the call from the police uh, in Phil's podcast. So tell us about uh, that moment. How was your parents' reaction? <laughs> sure. So, uh, you know, back in the, in the mid-80s, I, I went to university and I went to uh, a small university in Nova Scotia called St. Francis Xavier University. And I went there to get a business degree. So I got my business degree and I came back home and I started working as a financial planner. So helping people with retirement planning and finances and all that sort of thing. So I thought that was my calling in life. I thought that's what I wanted to do. Anyway, after, you know, uh, a number of months of doing this, uh, I thought to myself, nah, this is not what I want to be doing for the rest of my life. I learned some good information that I've, you know, that has benefited me over my lifetime with regards to saving and, and investing and stuff. But I don't, I don't want to be doing this anymore. So unbeknownst to my parents, I decided to apply for, for the RCMP. So, you know, I was one of those kids growing up that, you know, my parents didn't have much trouble with me. I was always involved in sports and, and that sort of thing, which kept me busy and out of trouble. So uh, you can imagine the, my mom's reaction when she's home one day and gets a call from an RCMP officer saying, I need to speak to uh, William Malone. And my mother uh, was absolutely gobsmacked when she got the phone call. She thought, like, why are the police I went to all the bad places, right? Like, always oh, committed a crime. He's done this. He's done that. All that stuff. So, uh, I got home from work that same day that she got the phone call. And as I pulled in the driveway, because I was still living with my parents at the time, my mom was standing on the doorstep, and she was like, my my mom never got upset. She never raised her voice. She was, you know. But when she was upset, you could tell, right? And I pulled in the driveway, got out of the car, and my mom is looking, staring down at me. And she says, I got a call from the RCMP today, and they want to talk to you right away. So with that, I said, okay, thanks, mom. 
and walked in the house. And of course, she was not satisfied with that response and whipped around and came in behind me. And she says, what is going on? And uh, anyway, I told her, I said, oh, I said, I applied for the RCMP. And the look on her face was like, she, my mom was a nurse, right? So in her nursing days, I mean, she had dealt with lots of prisoners and bringing people into the emergency room and all sorts of things. And she looked at me and she said, why would you do that? Why would you do that? She said, you just got a business degree. Why would you want to do that? Anyway, I said, because, you know, it interests me and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I left it at that. And, you know, you know, history, you know, uh, I, I, I had a great career. Uh, my mom was one of my biggest supporters, you know, throughout all that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Right. I mean, I really enjoyed my career and met a lot of great people and got to travel the world and, you know, and see things and, and do things that most people only see in, in, on TV. Right. And, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I, uh, I really enjoyed it and, and had the opportunity to, to, you know, to speak to you and, 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 and talk about my, my time in Afghanistan is, uh, for me, it's been really rewarding because I think the more we talk about this stuff, I think the more the better understanding that people have uh, of of what's going on. And and look, you know, I'm speaking from my perspective. I'm certainly not an expert on on you know the military or government or anything like that. All I can tell you is you know what my experiences were and and how it in the impact that. It had uh, while I was there. So, um, you know, with that, I'll I'll actually leave you with a quote, and it's from uh, it's from uh, someone you may have heard of, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and it says, "You must not lose faith in humanity. Humanity is an ocean. If a few drops of the ocean are dirty, the ocean does not become dirty." So, when you think about that. There's a small group of people in Afghanistan that represent the dirty drops of water. Afghanistan is a big ocean, and there are a lot of very good and kind and hardworking people in Afghanistan. And those are the folks that we did our best to try and help. And uh, I think people can't lose sight of that because it's very easy to stereotype people. It's you know, the broad brush of saying, oh, you're, you know, it's, it, you're from Afghanistan oh, and people have a certain image. There's lots of good and hardworking people there. And, and you know, I, I, my wish is that, um, you know, the Taliban don't come to power and people can, you know, go about living their lives and, and raising their families and having long lives and health and prosperity. So. Uh, with that, I will turn it back to you, Rat Nadeep. And uh... thank you once again, Bill, for taking your time and speaking to us. It was an absolute honor speaking to you. Thank you for your service, and I urge all my viewers to pick up a copy of the book "Cops in Kabul." This is one of the most important conversation I think we are trying to have and trying to record on Canada's contribution to international policing. We also had the privilege of hosting Inspector Ben Morey and uh, Ambassador Chris Alexander as well on the podcast. So thank you once again, Bill, for taking your time and speaking to us. You're welcome, my friend, and and thanks to all your uh, your listeners for tuning in. Uh, I, I I really appreciate the opportunity, and uh, if if people are interested, this is some some uh, some self promotion here now. So if people are interested, this is the book that I wrote about my time in Afghanistan. It's Cops in Kabul. You can get e copies of it on Amazon, which is probably the easiest and most economical for most folks. Um, if you're interested in a hard copy, of folks are uh, I can uh, they can go through you, Rat Nadeep, and, and you can let me know if people are interested in in acquiring a hard copy of it. And we can we can figure that out. So I'll leave that with you. Well, I appreciate the kind words, Rat Nadeep, and and uh, again, you know, the reason I wrote it. Um, was there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, uh, I was really surprised when I first came back to Canada that nobody knew about the, uh, the Canadian policing contribution to the mission itself because a lot of the focus was on the military. And I mean, you know, all the kudos, 
all the all the kudos and credit that they received for the work, the very hard work that they did there were well deserved. But I thought it's unfortunate that people don't know anything about it. So uh, I, I I wrote it. That was a primary reason. And then I also wanted it uh, to have some sort of legacy for my daughters. And you know, in the years to come, that you know, I can book hey, some pretty cool stuff along the way. And, 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 and tell that story. But I've been in, trying to encourage uh, my, my uh, Canadian policing colleagues to, to start putting pen to paper or fingers to keyboards, I should say, and start writing because this is just a very small snippet of, you know, this is, was my experience, but, you know, there's lots of other experiences out there that need to fill in that gap in history. And, and that's what I've, I've been trying to encourage some of my former colleagues to, to do that. And I, uh, I think I've convinced a couple of them. So uh, hopefully that they'll, uh, they'll do that. But anyway, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I really appreciate it. And if you have any follow-up questions or whatever, or if your audience does, um, just you, you know how to get a hold of me and uh, I'll answer it as best I can. And Ben and Ben actually wrote a good book about uh, uh, about peacekeeping, uh, Canadian policing efforts, and various peacekeeping missions around the world. So, if, if people are interested in that, I'd encourage you to pick it up. It's a it's a good read.